All right, here we go. Let's jump into lesson 16. Our first activity today is, as you can see, a notice and wonder all about puppy weights. So let's dive into this. It says, here are the birth weights in ounces of all the puppies born at a kennel in the past month. So the first things I noticed is I was like, okay, well, it doesn't look like there's exactly, well, nine times three would be 27. So it looks like there's 25 here, 25 puppies born in the last month. But the first thing I noticed actually more than just the number of puppies that were born was how, how alike all these numbers are, right? Did you notice that? I noticed that there was quite a few 17s in here quite a few 18s in here. So that's really a common ounce weight for these dogs. A couple of them were a little bit bigger and a couple were a little bit smaller. But yeah, the vast majority of these puppies were 17 or 18 ounces. So that's kind of cool. Come, a couple of things that I wondered about this, of course, with this data that we're given, I wonder what the mean is, what the average amount of weight would be. I mean, I have some suspicions that it'll be 17 or 18 just because there's a lot of those. But I also wonder if that's going to be a good center or if the median would be a good center. Um, and I wonder, yeah, what other kind of things can we find out about this data? Um, like the range, I could probably find the range pretty fast by subtracting 20 minus 13. So I know the range is seven. Uh, I, you know, I kind of wonder about these 17s and 18s. Would that be my inner quartile range of just one? because there's so many of them. Anyway, there's a bunch of things I wonder about this data. So as you're going through this activity, number one, don't forget to write down those things that you notice and those things that you wonder. Hopefully, maybe they were the same as mine. So um, that basically is all for activity number one, although I do expect you to write some things down for that. But I'm not going to take the time today. As you have probably noticed, whether it was in the... Uh, module earlier or just now. I've got a big X through activity number two. Unfortunately, we can't do this one because we, we couldn't do this activity a couple of days ago with your names and the number of letters in your names. Remember that activity. So we don't have that data to work from. So we're going to skip activity number two today. We don't really need this one. It was just additional fun activity, but um, we don't really need it to learn what we need to learn today. So we're going to skip it. So let's go straight into activity number 16.3 today. This one is a good one, and I love the topic of this one. It's studying blinks, like eye blinks. It says 20 people participated in a study about blinking. The number of times each person blinked while watching a video for one minute was recorded. The data values are shown here in order from smallest to largest. So that I really appreciate. It put them in order. Notice this is our lowest number and it goes steadily up towards our largest number over here of 51 blinks. That person blinks a lot. Okay, and then it says for part A, use the grid and axis to make a dot plot. So the first thing we're going to do is make a dot plot of this data set. So just a little bit of reminder on how we make a dot plot. Each one of these values becomes a dot on our number line. And it gave us a grid, so it's pretty straightforward. We can follow those lines. So our first dot is going to be at three. So if this is five, three is over here. And I'm going to go one grid mark up from there and do a dot. Okay. I'm going to mark these as done along the way just so that I don't lose my place. And I'm just going to go down. So 16 is my next number. You could go in whatever order you want to go in. Doesn't really matter. 16 is next. And then six, so over one from five is our next dot. And then 18, 15, 16, 17, 18 would be over here. And then eight, 10, nine, eight is here. Five, six, seven, eight, yeah, that's right. So that's eight. 20 is right here on. That's weird, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So I guess this one is 20. That's weird that they numbered 20 where they did, but that's okay. So there's 20, and actually there's another couple of 20s, so I'm gonna do three 20s. Maybe I should have done these in order so that we could count that way, but whatever. Um, there's looks like there's two 11s, so I'll do both 11s at once. 
So 10, 11, and there are two of them. Okay, and then a 13, 15, 14, 13. Uh-oh, am I wrong on which one was 15? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so I am off. So this is a 14. And there's actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 14s. And then I need to get my 13 in there. So there's the 13. Okay, so I've done all the 14s there. Hopefully I haven't messed this up too badly. And then at 22, so that was 20, 21, 22. Okay, so there's the 22, 23, 24 is that one. And then a 32, to let's see, that was a 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32 is over here. And then 36, 33, 34, 35, 36. Yeah, these grid lines don't actually match up with my numbers very well. Hopefully yours are a little bit better. 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. Yeah, these don't line up very well, do they? If I use the grid lines perfectly. Let's double check that we got these all right because I wasn't expecting those grid marks to be off so badly. One, two, three. No, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven has two, twelve, thirteen has one, fourteen has one, two, three, four. So we're good there. And then 15, 16 has one, 17, 18 has one, 19, 20 has, 20 has one, two, three, that's right. And then 21, 22 has one, 23, 24 has one. And then, so this one is over here is actually 25. And this one is 20, right? So these that are these ones that are kind of off, I'm gonna kind of mark here. So this one's 25. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 is actually over here. 31, 32 is good. 33, 34, 35 is over here. So then this is 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. This one's 40. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. This one over here is 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51. Okay, so I am right. 52, 53, 54, 55. See, 55 was clear on the end there. Okay, so maybe I should have done the spaces between the line. I don't know. But there's our dot plot. Either way, we've got our dot plot done. So we won't waste more time on that. So there's our dot plot. Now, ooh, I might just sneeze here. I don't know, maybe it'll be a false alarm. It usually is, right? All right, part B, find the median or the Q2 and mark its location on the dot plot. So median, of course, is the middle dot. How many dots do we have? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Oh yeah, we did know that, 20 people. So a fast way of finding the median, if I know I have 20 people, that I know that dot numbers 10, uh, yeah, dot number 10 and 11 probably are going to be our middles. So if we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, there's dot 10. If I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, see, I knew I'd, I'd have two dots in the middle. So one of them is 14 and one of them is 16. So our median must be 15. Because halfway between, of course, 13 and, and 16, I mean, 14 and 16 is 15. So our median is 15. Okay, so there's our median. Find the first quartile, Q1. So now 
As I said before, I've got 10 dots this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 on that side, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 on this side. So we have split it exactly in half, so now I need to split the bottom half in half. So if I have 10 dots, then of course dot number five is gonna be in the middle, so one, two, three, four, five. From this side, one, two, three, four, five. So it's between these two dots now, which is halfway in between, which is right here. So I'm gonna actually label this Q2, that's my median, right? This one right here is Q1. I'm gonna label that with a 15 as well. And then over here, this is my Q1, which is 10, 11, 12. Yep, so that's Q1 is 12, okay? And then I do the same thing on this side. One, two, three, four, five. There's my one dot. One, two, three, four, five is this dot. So halfway between 20 and 22 is, of course, 21. This is our Q3 of 21. Okay. So first quartile, Q1. Whoops, whoa, that was a bad Q1. Q1 was 12. Q3 was 21, okay? And we marked their locations on the dot plot, so that part is good. Moving on to part D, what are the minimum and maximum values? So we need the minimum and the maximum values. Well, the minimum is gonna be our first dot down here, and that looks like it's five, four, three, which makes sense, because that is our smallest number, so the minimum is three. I'll label that on our picture. The maximum, of course, is our biggest dot, and we know that from our data is 51, is our max, so there's our max of 51. Okay, so we have answered, and in fact, we found our big five, right? One, two, three, four, five. We found all of the big five numbers in our number set, in our data set, so there they all are. Moving on to the next question here, I believe there's a number two in this activity. Yes, there is. And this is the bulk of our activity, our lesson this week, is something called a box plot. Sometimes it is also called a box whisker plot. In fact, I prefer that name because box plot kind of is a tongue twister, especially when you've got a dot plot and a box plot and a, anyway, it's just a lot to say. So I like to call it a box whisker plot. You'll probably hear me calling it that often. A box whisker plot. It says a box plot or a box whisker plot can be used to represent the five number summary, right? Which I call the big five, right? I always just call it the big five. Okay. Uh, let's draw a box plot for the number of blinks data. So we're going to use this data that we found in number one, right? We're gonna use that data to now make what's called a box whisker plot. And we're gonna draw this on the grid above the dot plot. So we're gonna use the same grid and we're gonna draw what's called a box plot or a box whisker plot right up here in this space. Okay, so the first step we need to do is we draw a box that extends from the first quartile to the third quartile and we're gonna label those quartiles, okay? so. From quartile one, which is right here at 12, okay, I'm gonna go up this line and I'm just gonna draw a box. It does not matter how tall you make the box, so I'm gonna make it three grid lines tall, but it needs to go as far as Q3. So here's Q3 over here at 21. So that'll be the other end of my little rectangular box. Do you see that? And I'm just going to trace this grid lines to make a box. Literally, you are just drawing a rectangle. Like I said before, though, it started at Q1, which was 12. So I'm going to label this end as that. That is Q1 or 12, okay? This end of the rectangle is at Q3 or 21. So I'm going to label that Q3 or 21, okay? So that's the first part of our box plot. That's the name, right? We've got our box on our plot, okay? Now, that was step A, we've done that. 
Step B says is at the median or at Q2, we're gonna draw a vertical line from the top of the box to the bottom of the box. And we're gonna label that the median. So if we look at our data down here, we already have our Q2 labeled at 15. So we're gonna go up into our box now, and we're just gonna draw a vertical line in the middle of that box, okay? And that is our Q2 or our median at 15, okay? So that's what that line inside the box represents. We know that line is the median. Again, the bottom of the box is our first quartile, and the top of the box is the third quartile, okay? So there's the box part of the box plot. We are now done with part B. Part C, from the left side of the box, Q1, right, draw a horizontal line, also known as a whisker, there comes the name of the plot, a whisker that extends to the minimum of the data set. So here's what this looks like. Our minimum is at three. So at three on our little plot here, I'm just gonna draw a short little line. It does not have to be as long as the box is. In fact, it shouldn't be. And then you're gonna draw a horizontal line from the minimum to the box itself. And that's all it is, okay? So this is our minimum. So I'm gonna label that min period at three and that is the end of what's known as the whisker, okay? Which kind of looks like a little whisker hanging out, right? Okay, so there's the minimum and the left whisker. Next, on the right side of the box, Q3, we need to draw a similar line that extends to the maximum of the data set. So there's another whisker here. This one goes all the way over here to the maximum. So our maximum is here at 51. So again, I'm gonna draw a little, a little line here at 51. I'm gonna label that the maximum at 51, right? And that is gonna be the right side of my, I'm gonna actually use my straight edge here because this is a long whisker. So I'm gonna use this to help me make sure it's straight. It's always handy to have a straight edge. Okay, we just need to make sure it's thick enough that we can see it different than the grid marks, right? So I like to make it nice and thick so that we can tell where the whisker is, okay? So again, the part, this right here, we're done. This is a box whisker plot, ladies and gentlemen. We've got our box. The box always extends from the first quartile to the third quartile with the median as a vertical line somewhere inside, right? The minimum is at the end of the left whisker, and the maximum is at the end of the right whisker. That right there is a box whisker plot, or as this book calls it, the box plot, okay? So now we are done with step C, which means we're done making our box whisker plot, okay? Number three, you have now created a box plot to represent, represent the number of blinks data. What fraction of the data values are represented by each of the elements of the box plot? So we have to think back to what we know about the minimum and first, second, and third quartiles and the maximum. If we remember back to when we learned about these, each one of these split the data into fourths, right? If you remember, between the minimum and Q1, we have one, two, three, four dots. Between Q1 and the median, we have one, or five dots, did I count wrong? One, two, three, four, five. Between Q1 and the median, we have one, two, three, four, five dots. Between the Q2 and Q3, we have one, two, three, four, five dots. Between Q3 and the maximum, we have one, two, three, four, five dots. So again, we have split the data exactly into four fourths, right? There were 20 data values. Split that into four equal groups. Of course, each of those would have five dots in them or five data values in them. We've split them into fourths. So if we think about what our data dot plot did and what our now box plot does, the whisker, the left whisker 
goes from the minimum to Q1, right? To the first quartile. So that must be one fourth of the data, right? So it is, let's see, does it want, yeah, it says what fraction? So it is one fourth, okay? The box in part B, well, the box has from Q1 to Q2, that's one fourth of the data. And it has from Q2 to Q3, which is another fourth of the data. So all told, the box has one half of the data. Remember when we learned that inner quartile range is the middle half of the data? That's what this is talking about again. And in a box plot, it's even easier to see because it literally is the box that is the middle half of the data. So the answer here is one half of the data. The right whisker, just like the left whisker, there were five dots here, there are also five dots here. Even though it's longer, it still only represents one fourth of the data or five data values, right? So this is still one fourth of the data. And if we add this all up, a fourth of the data plus a half of the data plus a fourth of the data is four fourths of the data or all of the data, one whole set of data, right? So that's how box and whisker plots work. They represent those pieces of the big five. And that's why, frankly, that's why we have the big five is so that we can create this box whisker plot. That's kind of the point of the big five or the, as this book calls it, the five number summary, right? Remember that, that big five. We use that big five to create these box whisker plots so that we can represent that data in a very easy and easy to understand and easy to identify way. So as you can see, just looking at a box whisker plot, we can identify those five big number summary values quite easily, okay? And that's the end of our lesson, ladies and gentlemen. This Are You Ready For More has you build another box whisker plot and find all the pieces so it's a really great way to study, but of course it is optional if you'd like to try that. The lesson summary goes through all that vocabulary once again. It talks about the boxes and the whiskers and how they are identified by each of the pieces and it gives you some examples. Again, we call them dot plots because this book likes, likes putting them as dots, but you could use X's or basically any symbol you want and it would be the same idea. But box whisker plots do go with the data quite well, and it's a great representation of the data. So you can read through that as the lesson summary. We are now ready to dive into the homework for lesson 16. This is once again gonna give us the practice we need to get really good at these box whisker plots. There's a perfect example of one right there. We'll practice with that, answer some questions with that as part of this practice activity. So. Dive into that, give it your very, very best, and in a few minutes, I will come back and we'll go through the answers together. You are doing, let me double check, but I'm pretty sure we're doing all the problems on today's. Yep, there's nothing that we need to skip, I don't think. So, yes, do all six problems on tonight's Lesson 16 Practice Problems. I'll meet you back here in just a few minutes, and as always, never forget. Do your best, because you deserve your best. to grading lesson 16's practice problems. I hope you've done your best to do this on your own. Let's make sure you did it correctly now. Number one, each student in a class recorded how many books they read during the summer. Here is a box plot that summarizes their data. Okay, so number of books under our number line and then our box or box whisker plot as I like to call them. We've got our box, we've got our whiskers, um, and our five number summary is very obvious on this, isn't it? So let's go through and answer these questions. What is the greatest number of books read by a student in this group? Well, the greatest number of books, that's the maximum, right? Can we see the maximum on our box whisker plot? Absolutely, because we know the maximum is over here on the end of the right hand whisker. So all we have to do is use our number line to help us find that maximum value and it is 15, so our maximum is 15 books. 
Easy peasy, there we go, part B. What is the median number of books read by the students? Well, if you remember, the median or the Q2 is the vertical line in the center of the box, that's Q2. And it happens to have a value of six. So our median or our Q2 equals six books is the average number of books read by these students during that summer. Part C, what is the interquartile range? Well, if you remember, interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. And in this case, those are the ends of our box, right? The right-hand end of the box is our Q3, and the left-hand end of our box is Q1. So let's find those values. Q3 looks like it's right at 10, and Q1 looks like it is at five, right bef between four and six, which is five. So our interquartile range, IQR, is 10 minus five, which is five books. Okay, so that means that half of our kids read five books. That's kind of cool. Number two. Oh, so before I move on to number two, because that's a whole different problem, let's make sure we understand this data. Like I said before, this interquartile range or the number of kids that fell within this box, remember that's half of our data, right? That's half of the people in this class. So that means that half of the people in the class read five books last summer. That's pretty impressive. The largest number of books that were read were 15. So somebody read 15 books, right? At least one person read 15 books. Um, and then the median or the average student read six books, but half the kids read at least five. So that's pretty impressive. And that's, we can get all of that information simply from a box whisker plot. Pretty great, right? Moving on to number two now. It says to use the five number summary, so it gives us one, two, three, four, five data values, which are those big five, right? And it asks us from here to draw a box whisker plot. So let's do that. I'm gonna start out with my trusty little uh, straight edge here. Of course, we need our number line at the bottom, right? We have to have that number line so that we have our reference points here. So let's start out with that number line. I'm gonna kind of move over this way a little bit. Get a nice straight number line going on. And then we can take a look at our data and decide what values we need on this number line. Um, our minimum is 40 and our maximum is 60. So that's really the only, that's the range we need, right? So actually I'm gonna start a little bit below 40. I'm gonna start at 35 and I'm gonna end at 65. Let's see if I can figure out how many tick marks I'm gonna need. 35, 40, 45, 50, 55. Oh, I see, I'm not gonna need this long of a line. 60, 65. I, I wanted to make these evenly spaced, so I actually don't need all of this extra, which I wondered if I didn't space them out enough, but that's an easy fix with a simple eraser. So that's 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, and 65. I like to go slightly above and slightly below so that I for sure have a long enough number line, okay? And then we start plotting these different values on our number line, like this example above, right? So that we can use this as kind of our example box whisker plot to know how to draw this new one, okay? First bit of data we know is the minimum is at 40. So again, at 40, that's our minimum. So we're gonna draw a line at 40, and that's gonna be the bottom of our left-hand whisker, okay? I'm gonna label that minimum, okay? The next thing we need is our first quartile, or our Q1, and that's at 45. So 45 is where the bottom of my box is going to be, or the left side of my box is gonna be, and also where the end of that whisker extends to, right? Remember the whisker runs from the minimum to Q1. So I'm gonna label that as our Q1 right at 45. The next thing we know is our median. Our median is at 48. So we can kind of eyeball 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. So 45, 46, 47, 48 is about right here. 
that's going to be a vertical line and that vertical line is going to be inside our box when we draw it but i'm going to right now label that as q2 so we know that's our median at 48 and i'm actually going to label it 48 because it's not an actual number on my number line okay so now i'm done with the median ready now for q tile quartile sorry i said that wrong quartile three which is at 50. So right here above 50, I'm gonna draw my end, my right end of my box at 50, label that Q3. Ooh, that Q went a little crazy. Let's redraw that. Q3, now I can finish my box. Okay, nice straight thick lines to close up our box, okay? So again, I have my minimum down here at 40. I have my first quartile or my lower quartile at 45. My median or, or second quartile is at 48. My third quartile or upper quartile is at 50, okay? The only piece I have left is my maximum, which is clear over here at 60. So straight up from 60, I'm gonna do another short line, label that my maximum. And that again is the end of my right hand whisker. So I'm gonna draw a nice straight thick line for my right hand whisker. Kind of make them look the same. Okay, and there is my maximum right at 60. So now I am done drawing my box whisker plot for number two. That's all there is to it, okay? So really the only things I need data wise are those big five numbers and then I can draw a box whisker plot, okay? Moving on to number three now. The table shows the number of hours per week that each of 13 seventh grade students spent doing homework. Create a box plot to summarize their data. So once again, we're going to make a box plot of this data. What great practice they're giving us on doing this. And you know what, I'm kind of out of room. I wonder if I can use the, not the space, I think I can. I'm gonna use this space below number four to draw this box plot, just because it gives me a little bit more room to do what I need to do. Once again though, I'm gonna start out with a nice straight horizontal number line. Then I'm gonna look at my data and see what my minimum and what my maximum is because I need to label something near those in my on my number line, right? Now, I counted by fives on this one because I kind of noticed how spread out my data was, but this data is not very spread out at all. I bet I could go by ones from three to 11. That wouldn't be a big deal, right? But I'm actually gonna start at zero and I may go above 11. Once again, I like to go a little bit below and a little bit above, just so that when we start doing our plot, we're not going off the ends of our number line, right? So I'm gonna start at zero, and I'm just gonna count by ones, because I think it won't be that hard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I'm gonna go all the way to 13, 14, 15. One, two, I'm gonna label maybe by twos. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Maybe I should go to 16 just to close it out with an even number, okay? So there's my number line all ready to go. Now I'm ready to make a box whisker plot. But have you noticed what we're missing? We're missing our big five. In order to make a box whisker plot, we need the big five. We need the quartiles, right? We need the max and the min. Right now, the only thing we know are the minimum and the maximum. We don't know the median or the quartiles yet, so we're gonna have to do that first. Luckily, these are all, oh no, they're not in order. In fact, 11 isn't the biggest. Look what I didn't notice. 12 is actually the biggest, but that's okay because we have 12 on there anyway. All right, so we're gonna have to put these in order and we're gonna have to find the median and the quartiles. So let's dive into that. What's our lowest number? I think we were right on the lowest number. It is three. And then we have a four. 
Uh, and then a five. Ooh, I noticed a couple of fives. There's one, two, three fives. Okay. And then it looks like a seven would be next. And then a nine. And then a ten. And then a couple of elevens. I've got one, two, three elevens. One, two, three elevens. And then one, two twelves. Okay, so let's double check. I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13 seventh grade students, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 data values. Okay, we know we have them all. We know our minimum is at 3 and our maximum is at 12. In fact, we can even label those on our box whisker plot. Minimum is at 3. And our maximum is at 12. Okay, so there's our minimum and our maximum. Now we, let's find the median, the middle, right? And again, we know there are 13, so we could either count six in or we can just finger squeeze, right? I like to finger squeeze, then there's no mistaking. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's our middle. So nine is our middle. So nine is the median or the Q2. We can label that on our box whisker plot. I certainly hope I'm on screen. Oh my goodness. So there's my list of numbers in order. I hope you could see that before. I've got my minimum and my maximum labeled on my box whisker plot started here. Now I have found my median or my Q2, which is the middle, so it's nine. So I'm gonna label that on here. There's nine right there. We know that the median is gonna be the center vertical line in my box. So I'm just gonna label that for now. We'll come back and draw the box around it in just a second as soon as we know our quartiles, right? So the next thing we need to do is find that first quartile. Now, remember the median does not count as one of our data values, but everything else does, including the minimum. So we're gonna count from here. We're gonna finger squeeze the three and the seven, five and four. And then five and five, we have two middles. But of course, we know when we have two middles, we take the middle of the two middles, which is still five, right? Notice I have one, two, three to the left of the middle and one, two, three to the right of the middle. So five is quartile one. So at five, there's four, here's five. That's the end of my box or my quartile one. So I'm gonna start drawing this box I can go from quartile one to the median. There's the left-hand end of my box, right? Now we still have, oh, and that means I can draw my whisker as well. Once I have that quartile, I can draw my whisker, okay? But now I need my third quartile somewhere in the middle of here. So once again, I'm gonna finger squeeze 10 and 12, 11 and 12, I have two middles, 11, 11, which I could have suspected since it happened on this side, it would happen on this side as well. So halfway between 11 and 11 is where my Q3 lives, which happens to be, of course, 11, right? So at 11 is my upper quartile. So straight above here, I'm gonna draw another end of my box, label it 11. This is Q3 now. So I'm gonna extend my box all the way to Q3. Now I have my whisker going from there to my maximum, okay? I'm gonna turn this around just to make my nice straight lines here because this is one continual box, right? So I'm gonna just reinforce those lines so that it looks like one continual box, okay? And now we have our box whisker plot drawn, okay? We've got all five of our big five values labeled, our minimum, first quartile, second quartile, or median, third quartile, and our maximum. We've got our whiskers, we've got our box. Everything is labeled up. So again, this was number three's box whisker plot. Okay, so we're done with number three. Now for number four, its box whisker plot is actually on the next page. I'm gonna get rid of that name line so that we can actually see what we need to see here. 
So I'm just folding this paper down so we can see it. So for number four, this is the box whisker plot that it's talking about. It says the box plot displays the data on the response times of 100 mice to seeing a flash of light. How many mice are represented by the rectangle between 0 0.5 and 1 second? Okay, well, 0 0.5 is down on the left side of the box, and 1 second is on the right-hand side of the box. And if you remember, inside the box is half of the data. Right? Well, if I have a hundred mice total, then the box itself must represent 50 mice. Does that make sense? So the answer to this question, how many mice are represented by the rectangle? The answer is 50 mice or half the data or half the mice, right? So there is the answer for number four according to this box whisker plot. Okay, moving on to number five. Here is a dot plot that represents a data set. Explain why the mean of the data set is greater than the median. Well, the mean and the median are not labeled on this dot plot. So we're gonna have to find each of those probably to help us be able to explain, right, and show that the mean is in fact greater than the median. So here's a little great review. How do you find the mean? Well, the mean is the sum of all of our data values divided by how many data values we had, right? So let's take the sum of two plus two plus two, because there's three of them, plus three, plus three, plus three, because once again, there are three of them, plus four, plus five, plus eight, plus nine. Now, how many total dots did I have? I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm going to be dividing by ten. Okay, so let's go ahead and find the sum of all of these values. We've got nine plus eight is seventeen plus five is 22, plus four is 26, 29, 32, 35, 37, 39, 41. Now I got 41, but I'm gonna double check that. Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 19, 24, 32, 41. So I was right. 41 divided by 10, as we know, we can just move the decimal point once, is 4.1. So the mean, whoops, is 4.1. So let's label that on our dot plot. The mean is about right here. So I'm going to do the triangle for the mean, okay? So my mean, I'm going to label it too, is 4.1. Now we need to find the median. Now the median we can do right on the dot plot. We know we have 10 dots. So on the left side of the median, we're gonna have five dots. And on the right side of the median, we're gonna have five dots, right? So let's count them. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So it happens right between those two dots, which means the median is three. The median or Q2 is three. I think we just showed that the mean is greater than the median, didn't we? The mean is 4.1, the median is three. So we just showed that that is true. Now all we have to do is explain in words. Well, we just say that. The mean is 4.1, I calculated it, right? And the median is three or the middle is three, so therefore 4.1 is greater than three, so that explains that that is true, okay? So that is the answer to number five. Don't forget to explain that in words for good practice. Last one is number six. It says Jada earns money for babysitting, walking her neighbor's dog, and running errands for her aunt. 
Okay, so I'm gonna organize my information here. I know that Jada babysits, right? She walks the dog and she, what was the other thing? Oh, she runs errands. Okay, so she does those three things, okay? To earn money, okay? And then she combines her money and divides them into three equal parts. So she combines everything, but then she divvies it back out in equal parts, okay? One for spending, so this is spending. One for saving, I'll just do S-A, and one for donation, donation. Okay, but we know these were equal parts. So spending equals savings, which equals donating, right? Now, it says Jada donated $26. Okay, so she donated 26. Well, if that's true, then she saved 26 and she spent 26. Does that make sense? Because we know that she split them into three equal parts. So those must all three be equal. Okay. So far, so good. Let's read the question now. How much could she have earned from each job? So I want to know how much did she earn babysitting? How much did she earn walking the dog? And how much did she earn running errands for her aunt? Okay. Um, make two lists of how much she could have earned from her three jobs during the past four weeks. Okay, so we really don't know how much she earned from each of those jobs because it didn't say they were equal parts. It just said that she added them all together and then split it evenly. So what I think we need to know here is how much total money did she earn, right? So what is 26 plus 26 plus 26? Or in other words, 26 times three. Well, if I do the math here, it's $78. So all told, at the end of the month, she had $78. Now, the kicker here is we don't really know how much she earned babysitting or dog walking or doing errands, but we know that it has to add up to $78, right? So babysitting plus dog walking plus errand running equals 78. That's really all we know. So from here, our list of numbers can really be anything as long as they add up to 78. So for example, one way to do this, what if she babysat and earned $25? Okay, and what if for dog walking she earned $10? Well, how much money would she have to earn running errands in order to get $78? Well, 25 plus 10 is 35. 78 minus 35 is 43. So she would have to earn 43, ooh, $43 running errands for her aunt. Maybe she's got a rich, rich aunt, right? So that's one possibility. Well, maybe she spent a lot more time babysitting than I gave her credit for. What if she earned $40 babysitting? And maybe she earned $15 dog walking. Well, then how much money would she earn doing errands? Well, that's 55. If I take 55 from 78, that would be 23. So then she would have had to run errands and earn $23. Literally, ladies and gentlemen, these three numbers can be anything you want them to be as long as they add up to 78, because that is the definite that we know from the given information, okay? So here are two possible ways of solving this problem, but are there others? Absolutely, there's infinitely many other ways. In fact, you could make $25.30. Like you could even go into the cents and pennies and things, not just whole dollar. So there's a lot of ways you could split this up. But again, the key ingredient is they must add up and equal 78 so that when she splits that evenly, she can donate 26, okay? So that is problem number six. Hopefully you got that one right. That was a fun one. I liked it a lot. And that means we are done with our practice problems for lesson 16. 
I hope you did well. I hope you understand what we are talking about as we practice doing these box whisker plots and interpreting data from them, as well as, of course, the review we did with dot plots and with some of our money math problems. So good job on this homework assignment. You are now ready to do your check your understanding quiz. Go ahead and dive into that in Canvas. And as always, I know that you will. Do your best because you deserve your best. Woo!